Hello everyone, my name is Jenny Tenson and I'm Vice President and Chief Strategy Advisor at the Open Data Institute. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we move beyond a narrative that is around purely privacy uh, in terms of rights around data to one that is uh, thinks more broadly about equity as well. This talk is um, uh, inspired by some of the uh, things that I'm seeing happening in the way in which we're talking about uh, data at the moment. And in particular, the kind of artificial conflict that is being created between um, those on one side that talk about the real need for innovation and public good from data and, uh, and as if it is in some way opposed to the need for privacy and control around data. Um, and I think it's really important that we don't make that a conflict. I think it's something that we don't have to have as a, as a conflict, um, that we can do both. And so I want to talk a bit about why these things are important and, and how we can think about it. I'm going to talk then about why these issues about innovation and public good around data are particularly prevalent now and why we have to think about rights beyond privacy. I'm going to give a framework, talk through a, a framework for thinking about interests in and rights in data and then talk a little bit about implications for how we design data governance and data applications um, given those, those uh, distinct and different kinds of interests that you have around data. So a lot of this uh, talk is inspired by um, a, a paper um, by Salome Villion uh, called Democratic Data, Relational Theory for Data Governance. It's a fantastic paper and I do recommend that, that you go and read it. It is quite dense. It talks about datafication, about the population level effects of data, about the uh, kind of limitations of individualistic approaches to data protection and calls for democratic data institutions to, to manage data that is about lots of us. Um, so I'm going to go through a bit of, of some of the thinking and some of my own um, uh, ideas around this to, to try and explain how we make this a bit more practical. Um, so Salome talks about how uh, there, in the old days, there used to be a very simple way in which we interacted with data that was about us. Um, so uh, you would provide data to uh, about you to some arbiter, say a, a, a bank that was thinking about whether to give you a loan or not. And they would make decisions based on the information that you provided. And that's a very uh, kind of linear, uh, vertical, a uh, pure vertical relationship between yourself and, and the bank. But nowadays, where we have huge data sets of um, people who, uh, that are like you as well as yourself, then the arbiter isn't just making decisions based on the information you individually have provided. They're also making decisions uh, based on information about people like you, what their, um, whether they pay back loans, for example, might feed into a decision about whether you deserve a loan. And if you think, see it in reverse, then decisions about lots of other people are being made based on data about you. So, you know, whether they get loans is based on whether you make your repayments as well. And this sets up a different kind of relationship between us and the, uh, as, as individuals and the organization that is making those decisions and a relationship between us as, as people, as providers of data and as people who have decisions made about us and data. So this diagram kind of brings that together in a, in, um, in a kind of abstract kind of relationship. So we can see that often arbiters, people who are making decisions, organizations like banks or like public services will be using a database of population level data um, built up of personal data from lots of what I call donors. So people who are donating data into that database, whether kind of consciously and willingly or unwillingly. Um, then the arbiter, the organization will be making decisions about a particular thing for you. So whether you get that loan or, a, um, uh, or benefit, for example, based on not only personal data, but also um, 
that po population level data. And of course their decisions may give you benefits or they may give you harms. Um, and I call the people that are affected by those decisions victims, um, not because they're not because always uh, those are um, harmful actions on the behalf of the arbiter, but because the victims tend to not have very much control. In our current data protection kind of framework, we think a lot about providing personal data um, and the collection of personal data, but not very much, not as much about how data might be used by pe on people and to make decisions about people that whose data was never collected, right? Um, and it means that there's this relationship between donors and, and victims. And sometimes those are the same people, but other times then they can be very different people. Um, so for example, a database might be made up of, of images of faces uh, in another culture and then be used in a, in a particular country where um, the, the donor data is very, very different from the victim data in, in that context. So, Thinking about it in those terms, um, there are two sets of kind of places where we need to weigh up different kinds of interests. The first is around individual interests versus collective interests. And individuals do have interests in the way in which data that is about them gets collected and stored and, and, um, and then used. So for example, um, uh, data collection can result in people feeling like they're being watched and um, being uncomfortable with that feeling. We all feel uncomfortable when we feel like we're being watched all the time. It open, the fact that data has been stored about them means that um, there's a potential for data breaches and for identity theft. Um, and they, individuals may well have uh, interests in making sure that data isn't used in ways that don't benefit them, right? Um, we, we all want the, the things that we provide to be uh, used for benefit for us. Our collective interests, on the other hand, and you know, this is no more apparent than, than through the COVID-19 pandemic, is that we need to understand collectively what's happening in the world in order to direct resources, make better policy decisions. And it means that within that collective interest bundle, there might be some winners and some losers, some people who do benefit from data about them being, being used to make those collective decisions, and some people who don't benefit perhaps because we resources are directed away from them because in the assessment then we, we identify that they uh, have less need of them and there are there are higher priority things that need to be done. So there's always a tension between individual interests in data and collective interests um, that, that we have in data as, a, as communities or as societies. There's also this distinction between donor interests and victim interests. Um, if we have for example uh, a, a database of, of health records, then the donors into that might not want to be asked too many questions. It might be tedious to have to reply to them. And again, that feeling of being watched and scrutinized is, is problematic. Um, they do probably want the, the data to be used in ways that they approve of, um, and preferably that there's some benefit back to them as donors rather than it all falling to, to others, although that's not to discount that people do also have altruistic motives when they, when they donate data in those ways. Um, and then on the victim side, then, and the, uh, on those who, are, who have data used on them, um, they obviously want data to be used in ways that, that affect them, to be detailed, to be representative, to be accurate, to be um, something that is going to be uh, applicable to their, to, their, um, to their situation. And if you think about it, the fact that they want data to be detailed and representative makes an obligation on the donors to provide that detailed and representative data when they don't want to be asked too many questions. So there's a, there's a distinction there between donor interests and victim interests and different interests in, in the way in which we design data collection and data governance. 
now working through like those kinds of challenges um it's really useful to have tools to do that and um obviously i, I have to uh talk about our, our data ethics canvas um that developed by the odi that really helps you go through how data is being used um what kind of constraints there are what kind of impacts there might be from the way in which data is used but one of the things that's really important about the data ethics canvas is it emphasizes engagement with um communities and individuals who will be affected by the use of data. The other framework that I think is, is useful here is, is thinking about it in terms of public participation. And this framework, the IAP2 spectrum on public participation talks about how, you know, you can just inform people, let them know what's happening. You can consult them, tell them your plans and get feedback on it. You can properly involve them, have a more iterative process. You can work together to collaborate around, uh, around plans, around uh, anything, but in this case, case data um, data applications um, or you can empower them you can say that that you are in control of what happens here rather than um, and, and uh, give them the the authority and autonomy to to work out what to do so if we think about that in terms of the framework that I I was just describing about individuals and collective interests and victims and donors um, I think what might uh, you can see that you can map um, the different ways in which different individuals and collective interests might be represented from donors and from victims, how they might be able to be actively involved. So for example, you might have a application where individuals get to opt out, have complete control, get to opt out in their, in their privacy preferences from, uh, from data collection. Um, and you might have a collective mechanism as well for donors to get together to give their feedback on how data collection happens. Um, but in this example, it might be that the victims, whether individually or, or collectively, only get to know, only get to be told how data is going to be used. And that doesn't empower them in different ways. Um, so think, thinking about the different levels of participation of these different types of users, individuals and collectives, donors and victims, is a way of thinking through what kind of engagement you might need around a data project. Anyway, that was really quick, but I wanted to um, uh, give you some of the rationale for why um, the modern uses of data do require a different way of thinking about rights and interests beyond privacy and how in our modern data applications we do have to balance these individual and collective rights donors and victim interests in data um, and that in data projects we really do need to be clear about the different levels of engagement and participation we're using with those different individuals groups donors and victims um, just to set expectations and and to ensure that you're listening to the right kinds of, of, of people because there are choices to be made here um, but it, it's by working through what how we make those choices that we get to a system that properly balances the need for innovation and public good from data and the need for um, individuals to be protected and and, um, and um, feel autonomy thank you very much i look forward to your questions thanks jenny that was amazing as always um and i've got a couple of questions and then we'll pick up some more in the um in, in the chat but um if we just go straight into it so what does this you know for citizens who are navigating how big tech um impacts their lives so what's your point of view on, on how we we start to get some of our equity back so i think um the the Part of the point of what I was trying to get across in, the, in this talk is, is that, um, uh, you know, views around tackling that question that are focused on individuals somehow being able to do this on their own, get back equity on their own, are just not, um, not uh, well-founded. The, the fact is that it's a collective problem around 
how data about us is used and also like what it's used for and how it affects us. These are collective problems and therefore we need to kind of address them collectively. Now, um, there are different kinds of views about what that means. Like it, it, there, there could be a collective view that is lots of individuals getting together and through kind of people power as being able to um, do something about it. Um, or there's a collective view that is actually this requires international government action. And there's kind of anywhere, anywhere in between those. Um, personally, I tend to the latter rather than the former. I think that in order to shift the kind of power that big tech have, that we need, you know, proper collective action at, at an international level, at a government level, um, uh, and the, the, the kind of more um, kind of strappy yeah, um, kind of approaches with with unions and so forth that I think are going to find it very difficult to topple the kind of power that big tech has. And, and so normally my instinct would be, yeah, yeah, but we need to do something and government doesn't move fast enough. But over the past year, year governments, especially in Europe, have moved fast, haven't they? And, and um, could you just let us know something more about the way in which um, Europe has moved and how that might, how, how could the UK um, move in a similar way? Well, I think we're in a, we're at an interesting time, mostly because of how the US might move, right? So yep. the new Biden administration uh, might not be quite so, it might have a different kind of attitude or, or around, uh, around big tech. And in particular, I noted that um, Tim Yu, who has, uh, who has written about um, too big to fail organizations and that actually being big as a problem in and of itself has actually been appointed around um, kind of competition in, in uh, fair trading in, in the in the US, right? And I think that for me is the bit that makes the makes the change. Let's see what happens at say the G7 or through other kinds of international um, cooperation like this year, because it, it could be a, 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 a kind of switch, but it will take some pressure, I think, from from all around in order to um, amplify how, how big a problem this is for, for us as individuals and societally. So so you're so again, advocating and letting people know what an important um, issue it is for, for normal people is going to make a difference. And, and like what it is that we see the actual solution as, as being, because, you know, there are various different um, uh, approaches to that. You know, some people advocate for need for um, additional data portability, interoperability between these platforms as the way out. And others, it's like, no, we need to break up these big organizations in order to handle it. Um, so it will be interesting to see where that, that kind of balance falls. So yeah, interesting times, I guess. Yeah. And, and, and it could happen quicker than we imagine, I, th I guess. Like, like I say, I think that um, Biden is interested in this as, as an area. So uh, with that kind of leadership, you never know. Well, fantastic. As always, it's great to have you at uh, ODI Leeds. And it's a shame that you're not here in person. But um, Next year. Um, eh? Next year. Next year, absolutely. So thanks, Jenny. Um,